This is the Commission Church Online. Welcome to our podcast. We want to be a church who brings heaven on earth through the word of God and the love of Christ. I pray this week's message blesses you. Uh, Would you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Romans? We are going to talk about a subject that's been burning on my heart all week. Uh, and I've been, I've been praying about it, I've been studying it, I've been allowing God to pour into my heart, I've been worshiping on this, and uh, the worship team started us off with a song that had to do with the fatherhood of God. Uh, for those of y'all who have the Bible app, you can easily follow our notes. Uh, we have uh, the notes on there, the QR code's going to come up. Uh, we host all our notes on the Bible app. All you got to do is just scan it, it'll take you to the Bible app, and uh, you can put in your own notes over there as well. Uh, in Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 15, there's this powerful passage of scripture that kind of gives us an understanding or a beginning, uh, a beginning conversation about the fatherhood of God and what it means to have a relationship with God as a son or a daughter would have a relationship with a parent or father. Um, and, and in this conversation today, I want to kind of debunk some things. I want to debunk some, uh, some conversations that we probably had in the past, some teachings that we probably, uh, you know, bought into or, or understood before and things that we've never understood before. I pray that God will, and through his Holy Spirit, will reveal to us in our hearts this morning. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15, the Bible says this, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters, as kids, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a statement, and I, I want you to kind of take this with uh, a little bit of thought. Uh, we don't talk much about God in church, okay? Uh, I just kind of wanted to, you know, just um, open your eyes for just a second. Uh, we talk around God a lot. We talk uh, about things, uh, things about God. We, we talk about the things God does. We talk about, um, you know, wh- what, we, uh, what we have, uh, you know, when we have God in our lives, when we have Jesus in our lives, when we have, when we allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us, Uh, day after day in our lives. But so much of the church does not understand the the total character of God and who God is in his essence, in his beauty, in his love, because we don't have too many conversations about God himself. It's so important to understand God in his fullness without which you would not understand the things that we receive from God. Sometimes Christians get so encapsulated in this world of what do I have to benefit from God or we use God as a hey Siri thing where we we say hey Siri what's the weather today? Hey God I need this. Hey God I need that and when you have the answer you you, she listened. Uh, we, 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 We treat God as this ATM machine. We treat God as this person that is there to, at our beck and call, this person that just answers our needs and that's it and you say thank you and you're done with it. But my God is not Siri. My God is not Alexa. My God is not a person that you uh, define as somebody that does things for you. It's so important and, and pertinent to understand the character of God. And unless and until we understand who God is, There's so much about God that we will miss out on. And so many Christians can go through their lives and will go through their lives. And there are a lot of us that are sitting over here and that was me. I grew up in the church, literally on the mats of the church, on, you know, went to every service possible. My my parents were in ministry. I did all the Christian things possible. I gave, I tithed. I did every single thing possible. I went to every service possible. I went to Sunday school. I did all of it. And yet I missed the big point. We talk about how to please God. We talk about how to honor God. We talk about how to share God with others. But we don't talk about uh, staring at, at God and being lost in the beauty of God. Or why it is pertinent and important to be lost in who God is. And why biblically it's important to ponder on God and have God in our mind. Godliness is something that I'm really talking about this morning. 
The fear of God. What does the fear of God mean? Is it us trembling in the fear of this almighty sovereign being that can just, you know, do the stuff to us and we're gone, vanished? No, no, no. Or is it this, this, this conscious love that we have for this maker that, we, that, 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 that created us in his own image and in, in his own likeness? And, and my question is this. What comes to our mind when we ponder about God? A.W. Tozer said this once, there's nothing more important about you than what comes to your mind when you think about God. I'm going to repeat that. There's nothing more important about you, uh, about you than what comes to your mind when you think about God. See, your picture of God will ultimately govern the way you relate with God. Your picture of God Almighty or how you treat God Almighty or how you understand the character of God will, will ultimately dictate the way you have a relationship with God, whether you do or whether you don't. The way you relate with God will then eventually dictate if you have intimacy with God. And your intimacy with God will ultimately control your life that you're living, whether it is in God or outside of God. See, when we understand the basis and the need for intimacy with our maker, there's this relationship that we have with God that is elevated. When our understanding of God is, uh, is, is, is full of error from the beginning, we begin to develop this aversion to this idea of God. Can I tell you the idea of God that was instilled within, within me when I was growing up? This idea of fear. My relationship with God was one that was driven by fear. If I don't do this and this and this and this and this, I will suffer this and this and this and this. And ultimately, it was a, you're not going to go to heaven. And in this, in so much sin is right and sin is true. I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about, I'm not diminishing sin. I'm not covering sin up or saying that sin is not important. And that's not what we're talking about. We are sinners in need of repent, in, in, in desperate need of God. And we have to repent from our sinful ways and turn to God. That is the gospel. The, the gospel is that Jesus came for each one of us to die for our sins. It doesn't take away, that's not what I'm saying over here. But we have to understand who God is. Is your idea of God, this mean, angry guy in the sky with his lightning bolt in his hand, waiting to take you out when you break his commands? Or is your idea of God this sleepy, senile grandpa in the sky that painted the skies and he's there just watching over you and this, this man up there? Or is your idea of God this, this guy that punishes and judges or this guy that came 2,000 years ago and then just disappeared and, and we have this, this relationship with without even knowing who he is? Your idea and your perception of God and your understanding of God will affect the way you relate with God. See, nothing is more important than what you see him as. And today my question is, how do you see God? And I'm talking to teenagers today. I'm talking to young people today. I'm talking to people that have been in the faith for a long time. You've been baptized, saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. All of that is good. You have checked all the boxes. Yet, let me break something to you. You can live a life that you call a Christian life without having an intimate, personal relationship with God because you do not understand the true character of God and you've not had enough conversations about who God really is. You know, I, these days I spend copious amounts of time trying to prove to my daughters that I'm their father. And that I truly care about them. And when they think that I'm mean and uncool, I take my time to show them that I love them deeply. Why do I do that? I, I could just assume that they know me as father. I could just assume that they know me as a loving man, no matter how much I punish them, no matter how much I put them in time out, no matter how much I take away goodies from them and their screen time from them and all that stuff. I spend, consciously spend copious amounts of time spending, just instilling within them that no matter how much I discipline them, I am still their father and I love them unconditionally. And the reason I do that is I want them to understand my nature my character, who I am, not what I do. See, a lot of us can get, get, get caught up in what God does and what he doesn't do, that our relationship with God is based on doing 
rather than being. And I want to spend these next 20 minutes trying to show you how God is loving, how he's gracious, and how he says he's a father and he truly means it. In three days, I will be married to this gorgeous, beautiful woman sitting up here, Sonia, not Amy. Amy is married to this handsome man, <laughs> David, but I am married to this woman right here. Nine years. I still remember the day that I talked to her dad and asked her dad, hey, can I marry your daughter? He was, he was so happy. He was like, you, of course. You're, you're the one I was praying for all this while, you know. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> no, but I still remember the day that we got married. We finally said, I do. And, uh, you know, I, I came back after, I, 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 it was after the ceremony, I met, met with him, shook his hand, and I said, he said, he said, congrats, and I said, thank you, uncle. And, and he looked at me, and we call everybody uncle in our brown Indian culture, so I looked at him, and I said, you know, thank you, uncle, and he looked back at me and said, I'm not your uncle anymore. Call me dad. <laughs> Inside me, I kind of cringed for a second. Why? Because dad is an intimate term. Dad is, is something really personal, something really close. Like I could call him Mr. Cherry and I could call him uncle. I can call him your dad. I can call him Sonia's dad. Come on, am I talking? I, I could call him so many things. Yet he looks at me and says, from now on, because of a covenant that you share with my daughter, it makes you my son. So call me dad. See, of all the names of God, be it almighty, be it creator, be it ancient of days, be it maker of heavens, be it Jaira, be it Shema. Like, like look at what Jesus teaches. Uh, he, he says, I'm the creator, I'm the almighty God, I'm the provider, I'm the sovereign God, I am the Lord, I am the judge of everything. But he teaches one character more than any other thing in the Bible. And 189 times in four gospels, Jesus says... God is your father. He addresses God as his father. He says, God is your father. God says, call me dad. Like how many of us have that relationship with him? I'm going to break this down in just a second. See, when you don't see God the way he primarily wants to be seen, that will impact your relationship with God. Am I talking to somebody? I have this very bad habit of taking people's names and just shortening them and calling them. I, I've had people come up to me and say, I, I, Pastor, I, I, I like to be called by my full name. And I'm like, ah. Oh. Pastor Beverly was one. I, I, I used to call her Bev. And one day, I don't know why, but she, she didn't say anything to me. She wasn't like, call me Beverly. No, she didn't say anything of that sort. I just called her Bev one day, and something inside of me was like, ask her if she's Okay. With me calling her, like, like you calling her Bev. And I was like, hey, uh, Bev, are you okay with me calling you? She's like, oh, no, yeah, that's okay. But, you know, Miss Beverly's so nice. And she goes, but my name is Beverly. I like Beverly. And I was like, from that day onwards, you know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes you just assume. Like, how do people want to be called? Like God, like that's the thing. When you don't see God the way he primarily wants to be seen, that will impact your relationship with God. It causes dysfunction in your journey with God. See, this is the, the, the person that we're talking about is the one that flung the stars into the sky. And the same one, is this the same one that I should call dad? Like father? Is that the relationship that he desires of me? And the short answer is yes. Before you see him as provider, before you see him as your victory giver, before you see him as everything you see him as, he wants to be known as your father in heaven. I wish this comes, this, this hits you like it hit me when God spoke to me. To see the, that God loves me as a father kind of astonishes me. I want you all to journey with me in this. Like, like one of my biggest questions is why me? Like, how can he possibly see me and care about me in the middle of a billion people on planet earth? Because when I look into the mirror, what I see is a man who is stained and scarred and has been broken into a million pieces. 
Sometimes I feel unworthy to be in the same room as Jesus is, let alone a father-son relationship. And yet, he says, I am your father and you are my son. You know what the challenge is? The challenge is that many people encounter, that, that, that many people encounter is that accepting this truth is, is, is another glaring truth of what they see when they hear the word father. Like, like th that's association, right? The emotions that come over you when you hear a word that has an impact, on, th th that word will have an impact on how you view anything connected to that word in the future. Like, what does that word mean to you? They call it, psychologists will call it word association. See, when I was a younger preacher, I would just assume that, you know, the, the word father, it meant care and love and protection, right? That, those are the words that would come to my mind when I said father. And I would say, multiply it by a billion and you would, you would kind of figure out what God is like. I would walk into youth meetings and I would be like, guys, he's, your father is loving. Your father is gracious. Your father is forgiving. Your father is this and that. And I say, you think about your father and multiply it by a billion. And some of them would say, wow. And the others, I would just lose them. And I'm like, what did I say wrong? I'll tell you what is, see, from a young age, a child wants their father to see them. I see that with my, my two girls. Michaela and Carissa, one's seven, the other one's three. They're always, Daddy, look, Daddy, look. Look at me. Daddy, watch. Michaela did, uh, Carissa, my three-year-old, she really wants attention. She's the middle child. Any middle children here? Yeah, yeah. They, they really want the attention when there are two's next. She, she's like, Daddy, look. And I was like, okay, she's about to do something amazing. And she goes, <laughs> And I was like, what, baby? What? I'm waiting, I'm waiting. So you didn't see it? I said, no, what, 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 did, what did you do? <laughs> that's it. Gotta see me. Gotta look, 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 look. Anybody have kids like that? Like, that's all they want. That's all they want. They just want to be seen. They want you to acknowledge their existence. They want you to approve of their existence. They want to appreciate. They want you to appreciate their existence. And for a lot of people, these words don't come to mind when they hear the word father. For a lot of people, the word father means absent. It doesn't mean acknowledge their existence. For a lot of people, it means angry or disgruntled. It means aggressive or abusive or cheater or a liar. And then they multiply it by a billion. Am I talking to somebody? So I can get up on a stage and say, think about your father and multiply it by a billion. And it will make all the sense in the world to you. God, gospel, done. Say yes to Jesus. And you're like, nope. It means nothing to me. It means absolutely nothing to me. Because when they hear the, the word father, broken images come to their mind. Like when you think about God, like what image comes into your mind? When I say God is your father, what is the image that is come, coming to your mind? Or for some of us, it's the bad image that we have of fa bad fathers in the Bible. A bad father that, the, that Lot was to just offer his own daughters away. Esau and Jacob who played favorites. Or Eli, who was his permissive father. These are the ones that come to your mind. And through the word, we also discover as much as there are bad fathers, and the, the Bible brings that to light. The Bible also teaches us about this beautiful father, God, that is not just the creator, but he's also the father. He's not just the redeemer, but he's also a father. So much of a father that in Matthew chapter 6 and 1, in verse 9, when the disciples come up to him and say, hey, teach us how to pray, he goes, he says, he's, he uses our father in heaven, not God, the creator of heaven and earth. That's great, that's awesome, but my relationship with God has to be based off one that really is something that I can identify with, something that I can say, man, I belong a sense of belongingness is my DNA on this relationship. And God looks at you and me and says, my DNA is all over you. 
Don't compare my relationship with you to the relationship that you had with your earthly father. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 11, man, he's talking about what God is like and he compares it to an earthly father. Jesus does and he says, man, if a, if a, if a, if a child asks a father for some fish, would he give them a snake? Like, is that the God that we serve? Like, I'm not trying to throw shade on anybody's father. Don't get me wrong this morning. That's not my goal. Our understanding of the heavenly father shouldn't be limited by our experience with our earthly father. It's so much more superior to that experience, God, the way that he wants to be seen. Then how, Pastor Ashish, how do I see my father in heaven? Because all I can think about is my relationship. And for some of us, you probably had a great relationship with your father. For some of y'all, you probably had a very horrible relationship. For some of us, we didn't even have a father figure in our lives. I don't know who I'm talking to, but in Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, the Bible says this, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as, as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The word Abba is this very personal, intimate word that denotes trust and closeness. That's what the word Abba feels. And can, can we just be honest for a second? It's awkward. This is a weird relationship. And girls, I want you to listen up. Some of y'all are like, what are you talking about? The men can say amen to this because it is hard. Sometimes it is men for, it's more difficult for guys than, to, than for girls to look at. And, and, and a lot of people talk about this. Right? How can I call my, how can I call it Jesus? Daddy. Daddy God. Like literally saying Abba Father is calling God Daddy God. And for men, that's super weird. Come on, am I talking to some, like, men are not agreeing with me. You will go outside and you will agree, but in here you're like. <laughs> Calling him daddy God is weird, y'all, but the Bible reminds us that the spirit inside, see, that's what the Bible says there. The spirit inside cries out, Abba, Father. It shouldn't be weird. It shouldn't be awkward. It's awkward for those of you who are not sons and daughters. Am I talking just this? If you are a son of God and a daughter of God, this should not be awkward of looking at God and saying, God, you are my father in heaven and calling him father, calling him dada, calling him papa, whatever it is that you want to call him, calling him that. Because here's the wrong notion. The wrong notion is this. All created people are children of God. And you know what the problem with that is? That's not found in the Bible anywhere. Can we be truthful for a second? The Bible says this, the gift of sonship to God comes, becomes ours not through being born, but through being born again. I want to make that clear. Just because you were born, it doesn't make you a child of God. In John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, it says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. If you have not been born again, if you have not said, Jesus, come into my life, be king of my life, be Lord of my life, you have not been born again. And I want to encourage you, if you do not have a personal relationship with God, a one that a father has with a child, it's time to reevaluate your relationship with God and say, God, I want to have a personal relationship with you. No matter how old you are, no matter how young you are. See, relationship with Jesus can be summed up in the knowledge of God as one's dear father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes, makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If, 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 if this is not the thought that prompts and controls your worship and prayers, man, and your whole outlook on life, it means that you don't understand what Jesus did on the cross. The moment you open your mouth up, the moment you lift your hands up, your thoughts should go into what a loving father he is. That's what the Bible says. In Galatians 4 and 6, you know what the Bible says in the New Living Translation? It says this, and because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Y'all, if you didn't listen to anything else I said till now, listen from here. Y'all ready? 
He says, this is not a spirit of slavery. See, instinctually we feel like we don't deserve and we shouldn't live. It's like, 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 like we don't deserve it, God. We don't really deserve this. Really, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of punishment. But the Bible says, man, if you have Jesus in your heart, if you have asked Jesus to come into your heart, the Holy Spirit helps you diminish those negative feelings and those negative emotions and suppresses them by giving you the ability to cry out and still say, Abba, Father. That's what my daughters do. No matter even if they're in trouble with tears running down their eyes, they will say, Daddy. They will say, Dada. Because no matter how bad they've done, no matter how much they've messed up, they know that they can still run, come running into my arms and they can find a sanctuary because that is my character. I will still receive them with open arms. It's that sense of wonder, y'all. We all have that, those terms of endearment. What do you call your dads? Any, any, anybody want to? Some of us call them dad. Some of us call your dad, what, pops? Sir? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> no. Appa? Dad? Daddy? Anybody else? You, don't, you know, the first time I visited the Grand Canyon in Arizona... I still remember walking, we parked our cars on the side of the road, walked up to it. Anybody been to the Grand Canyon? So, three of y'all, okay. You, I don't know what this means, like, I went to Arizona, saw a picture and walked away. I don't know what that means, but I'll take this as I've been, so. Because this means I've been, you know, I don't know what that means, okay. But, but the first reaction, for those of y'all who have been, or the Niagara, right, the Niagara. How many of y'all wa- went, looked at the Grand Canyon and was like, oh man, that's it, and walked away? No. Like nobody ever goes up to the Niagara and I'm like, I am disappointed. No. Like what is your reaction as soon as you see a wonder? Wow. Every single time. Well, I've been three times. The third time I was like, okay. I didn't say wow anymore. My time, so like I, I've been here before. I've, I've seen this. This wasn't my first time here. See, wonder can be lost the more and more you visit a place. It can be lost. And for so many of us, the wonder of God is diminished because we have taken it so lightly. See, I, I want to talk to somebody today, but the Bible says this. There is something inside each and every child of God that when they ponder about God, automatically, the Bible says, the Spirit enables you to say, Dada. It enables you to say, Dad. It, enab- it enables you to say, I trust you. I love you. I messed up. The child of God has the ability to say, I know that I don't deserve mercy, but Dad. I've sinned, I've done bad, but Papa. And that's what Galatians says, it's not a weird thing. It's a thing that you come into the presence of God and say, I have a relationship with God unparalleled to anything else that, 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 that involves love, that involves generosity, that involves grace, that involves hugging, that involves acceptance, that involves I made you in my own image and in my own likeness. And I just pray that some of us will understand this. You can come help me on the keys. How can I see him as as a father every day, Pastor? Help me because I, I I get it. The wonder is important, but help me help me understand this fully. I want to help some of y'all this morning. Are y- y'all ready for this? How do I see him as Father God? How do I regularly allow my negativity to diminish and God to take center stage. How do I walk with greater confidence as a child of God? In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, John gives, lets us in. Are you ready for this? He lets us in and he says, he says this. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. He says, open your eyes and just see. Someone say experience. 
That's what he's saying. Just experience it. It's there. See it. He doesn't say, ask it to be revealed. He doesn't say it's not there. You know, dig around. He says, open your eyes and see. Experience. That's what he's saying, y'all. That we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. There's so much assurity in that. That is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that we did not know him. See, John, among all the other people like, like Paul and the other guys, they were raised to understand that works was more important. What they did was more important. See, what did John do to go from being afraid and scared and living under, under, under poverty and under the poverty of sin and under the slavery of sin to declaring this lavish nature of God? What did John do? And what is he trying to share with us? Three small things. One is he rested in the love of God. He rested in the love of God. He says, how great is this love? He says, see, how great is this love? This love is grand. It's grander than your mistakes. It's grander than your past. I still remember as a young boy, man, I would, I, I'd be sick all the time. And I, I, would, I would have these regular fevers. And I still remember. There's not much I remember from my childhood, but this I remember. Every time I would get this fever, and these fevers would come in back to back to back to back a lot. And I still remember I would get sick. And we had... We had a babysitter at home watching us. But yet, I still remember three times a day that my dad would leave his work. He would take an hour off to come. And I still remember when he would come knock on the door. Sometimes I would be sleeping. Sometimes I would be awake. But I would pretend to, be, to sleep the moment he walked in because I would love every single time he came in. He would come. He would lay his hand. He would check if I had a temperature or not. He would say a word of prayer over me. He would make sure I was okay. My mom would do the same thing, but she worked like miles and miles away. And my dad was closer, so he would make sure he came. He would touch me, and I would just enjoy that moment. Because if there's one thing you know about uh, brown parents, is that they don't express their feelings too much. They don't, they don't, they don't tell you, hey, I love you, son. I never got that growing up, but I knew that he loved me in moments like this. Where he would come and I would enjoy that moment that he would come and he would make sure that I was okay. And I, I took my medicine and I, and, and, and I drank some water and he made sure. And sometimes I'd fake being sick because I would like that attention. But, <laughs> but I was sick a lot and I, I enjoyed those moments that he would come, that he would check in on me. See, there's a lot of great fathers out there, but mine could be tender without saying a word. And I just learned to rest in his presence. To be okay with being taken care of. See, the degree to which we perceive God as a loving heavenly father, we will rest in his love for us even during the hard times. And if we do not perceive God as a loving heavenly father, we will not rest in his love, y'all. And I'm asking some of us, if you want to understand who God is and the fatherly love that he has for you, I'm asking you to lean in. Resting in God is important. I was putting Nora to sleep, our, new, our one-year-old. I was putting her to sleep the other day. And I was enjoying that moment. I was telling somebody out in the lobby, I said, when we first, before we wanted to have kids, I told Sonia, I want a soccer team. Ten kids. And then it became a basketball team. Reality hit, and then we said, five, we'll settle for five. And now we have three, and we're like, we're good, we're done. So I'm holding my third one. I'm holding my third one, and I'm putting her to sleep, and I'm enjoying every second of it because in my mind, I'm like, Lord, I don't know if this is the last one, you know, and, and I'm just enjoying looking at her face. And I don't know how many parents enjoy this, but I love when they breathe down on you. They're still, they're calm, they're, they're, they're just, they, they're so peaceful and they're so rested. It's like the psalmist says in Psalm 131 verse 2, Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. And my case, father, my soul is like a weaned child within me. 
See, through Jesus' sacrifice, I've been adopted in like... God is my father and I can rest against him in the way my little girl rested against me. My Nora was not worried about the latest news reports. She was not worried about the earthquake in Syria. She was not worried if she had a roof over her head or if we had money in our bank account. She just curled up on me. She went to sleep in a sweet and peaceful rest. And I want to remind somebody that you can do the same with God because he's your father. Resting brings revelation. When you're calm, when you're peaceful, when you're quiet, God can reveal so many things to you. And the second thing is this. The Bible through that verse says that he received the love of God. The Bible says how he lavished on us. See, the great the love the father has lavished. Someone say lavished. Which means he didn't have a choice. It was just poured out onto him. When something's poured out to you, you better get ready to receive. You better, that's the second point. He received the love of God. Not only did he, he was, he was sensitive to rest in the love of God. He received the love of God. He received what was poured out. Why? Because it was given to you for free. Like, I'm about to go to lunch after service today. We're about to have a great meal and we'll enjoy this meal and we'll pay for it. And then we, we have the receipt that says we paid for it. So the server doesn't ever come to us and says, I have a surprise for you. I have a gift for you. No, 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 you, you don't. I paid for that thing. You're not, you're not gifting me anything. I paid for that meal. It's mine. If you had to buy or earn it, it's not a gift. It's not what you've done, y'all. It's what's, what he's done. It's not your blood. It's his blood. You get to humbly receive it. We become the children of God, when not only when we rest in his love, but when we understand that we did nothing to receive it. Hence, when he says, I lavished upon you my love, learn how to receive the love of God and say, God, I want all of you. Not I'm a worm, Lord, I don't, deceive, I don't receive it, I want to run away. That's the Adam and Eve slavery mentality. The moment I sin, the moment I fall short, the moment I don't achieve, let me hide, let me run away. That's the slavery mentality. That's the, that's the mentality of, of sin. But God says the, the mentality of lavish living is the idea. He says we're adopted into the kingdom of God. So I didn't deserve this. I didn't deserve one ounce of this. I didn't have a, a heavenly father. But because I said yes to Jesus, he bought me in. He loved me. He lavished on me. Hence, I got to understand that I got to receive. How many of y'all can say, I want to receive God? Some of y'all just need to do that one thing. Receive his love. Position your hearts. Position your minds to receive his love. So many of us are living life closed off. You're protecting yourself. Your, 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 your walls are so high and God's like, give me a chance to overwhelm you with my love. And the third thing is this. It says he called us children of God. Can you stand up to your feet? The third point is this. Allow him to rename us. Allow him to rename you. Allow him to call you what he thinks about you. Can I encourage somebody? I want y'all to listen. Some of y'all need some time to get up. Y'all are focused on getting up. Okay. I want you to listen to me. I want to challenge you, to, I challenge you with this. I pray that you will never have thoughts and feelings about yourself that God doesn't have about you. Please. I want to encourage you with everything I got. What has he called you to be? He has called you his daughter. He has called you his sons. You've been given so many names in this journey of life, y'all. So many of y'all have, have had name-calling bullies all your life. Every one of us have been through high school and middle school. Forget middle school. My elementary kid came up to me the other day and said, Dad, somebody called me a bad name. It's starting way too young where the enemy plants his seed of name calling on your life. There are so many hurts that have been caused to me that I didn't let go of for many years because people labeled me so many things. 
I was labeled fatty. I was labeled chatterbox. I was called dumb and stupid. I was called all of that. I was a stutterer. I got, I got mocked for that. Kids have no mercy whatsoever. You know, we have adults that have no mercy either. I don't know what you could fill in all the blanks, the names that you've been called in your life. Anybody have bullies, name-calling bullies in your life? Yeah. But God calls you child in the middle of that. See, our perspective of self and identity should, should and must come from our maker alone. And that's God. In God, we find identity. In God, we find purpose. In God, we find essence. And you know what God calls you? God calls you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. You want to know what God calls you? He calls you saved and sanctified. He calls you the light of the world. He calls you the salt of the earth. He calls you a city, a city set on a hill. In Galatians 3.13, He calls you redeemed. He calls you loved in Jeremiah 31.3. He calls you chosen. He calls you His own. He calls you a chosen generation. He calls you an overcomer. He calls you a royal priesthood. He calls you kings and priests in holy places. He calls you a holy nation, a peculiar person, joint heirs with Christ. But more than anything else, He calls you His child and every time the enemy throws his mess at you you better look right back at him and says I don't care what label you throw at me I am a child of the living God and I am who he says I am I rebuke your thoughts devil I rebuke your plans devil I rebuke your ideas devil I rebuke your schemes devil in the name of Jesus we know and we understand come on somebody that we serve a God who is not just almighty who is not just all powerful but he he is our Father. He is Abba. He is Abba. So Father, thank you. You know, we're just going to get to take a few minutes to just worship today. I'm going to ask the worship team to just come on. But like we do every Sunday, I'm going to pray. I'm going to close. I'm going to dismiss. I'm going to say a word of blessing over you. But if you believe in your heart that God has called you for this moment to make some declarations, I'm going to pray right now. Before we pray and close and before you go, I want you to declare some things over your life. Are you ready for that? So I'm not going to single anybody out, but we're going to do this together. Are you all ready for this? Close your eyes, everybody. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands all over this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to declare over you that God is crazy about you. Whew. That intimate word, Abba. I want you to know that Abba loves you. That Abba accepts you. That Abba approves of you. He adores you. All your twirls. All your successes. All your failures. All your shortcomings. Every single thing you've done and you're going to do, Abba sees you. And each one of you need to say, Holy Spirit, prompt me. Every single time I want to give up, prompt me to call up Abba, Father. Can someone declare today? Say, I declare that I am who God says I am. I am everything God has made me to be and nothing less I confess and I agree because God says so that I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus I am saved and sanctified by the blood of Jesus I am the light of the world the salt of the earth the city set on a hill I cannot be hid. I am not a victim. I am not cursed because I am redeemed in Christ. I'm not rejected. I am not neglected. I am loved. 
I am chosen. I am worthy. I am God's own. I am not ordinary. I am a chosen generation. I am unique, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a peculiar person. I am not an orphan. I am a child of God and joint heirs with Christ. Uh, come on, somebody, give God a mighty hand clap of praise. Give God a mighty hand clap of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If anybody needs prayers, Sonia's going to be up here praying for people. I'm going to ask Chris to join her. If, 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 if you guys can take two of these spots. There's anybody that just needs prayers today. Some of y'all that needs to be broken from religion. Some of us, some of y'all that needs to just be broken from the pangs of injustice and the pangs of, of, of devil's lies over and over again to you. Some of y'all need to be broken from those, those name callers in your life. Because he calls you father. He calls you loved. I'm going to pray and close. If you want to linger after service, just linger, worship for some time. The worship team is going to continue in the presence of God. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for what you've done in this place and what you're going to do in this place. I pray for healing in this place. I pray for inner healing. I pray, God, for wounds to be healed this morning. In the name of Jesus, every hurt person in this place, they will not continue hurting other people. They will not continue living in hurt. They will be freed. They will be set free. They will live in freedom. They will live under the grace of God. They will live forgiven. In the name of Jesus, we live victorious lives because we serve Father, Abba, Father. We thank you for what you've done. May the Lord bless you. May He keep you. May He cause His face to shine upon you. May He be gracious to you. May He lift His countenance your direction. And may He give you peace that passeth all understanding. This week and the week to come, live not an orphan mentality. Live in freedom. Live as a child of God. Thank you for listening. We love bringing you the Word on so many different platforms. We are so thankful for what God is doing in and through us. We'd love for you to subscribe so you don't miss out. And don't forget to share this message if it has blessed you.